Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized tonight's event. Um, tonight we have a discussion about the book, The Scandal of Cal, which was written by Tony Platt, Professor Emeritus at UC Berkeley. Um, and he's going to be interviewed by Dean Chemerinsky, who has come to the Commonwealth Club many times. Uh, he's Dean of the Law School at Berkeley. So thank you very much for coming, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and giving me the tremendous pleasure to have this conversation with Tony. We're talking today about a book, The Scandal of Cal, Land Grabs, White Supremacy, and Miseducation at UC Berkeley. It's a terrific book, and I learned a great deal from it. Highly recommend it to you. But let me start by asking you, Tony, why did you write this book? This has an, a, an interesting provenance. I didn't start off to write a book. I started off about five years ago, uh, co-organizing a group on campus called the Truth and Justice Project. And the work that we did was to try to uh, speed up or get the university to acknowledge that it had failed to repatriate 10,000 or more human remains of native ancestors that had been dug up from graves and that uh, had been required by le federal legislation in 1990, the NAGPRA legislation, that required this to happen in a speedy way. And so our project, uh, working with uh, a few Native American faculty, working with uh, law students, some of whom are here today, uh, working with a few other people on campus, we started to try to uh, understand why there had been so much resistance by the administration, by the University of California, Berkeley, uh, to do the right thing. And in the course of doing that, I was responsible for the research and working on the research project. In the course of doing that, I began to pull at these threads that were all interconnected, that got me into areas that I didn't expect to find. And I didn't even really start off by writing a book. I was doing the research in order to try to implement the project and get the university to do the right thing. But that led to um, investigation of how the university got its land, uh, I got into an investigation of the long history of militarism and conquest that the university was a part of, into the history of the ideas that the university produced, uh, into the history of the architecture and design of the very place itself. So it, it ended up being a much more complicated history than I expected. And I spent most of my life in Berkeley as a student, as a graduate student, as a faculty member, living in Berkeley, growing, having my children grow up in Berkeley. And I always felt that I had a, a grasp of the history of the place. But when I started working on this project, I realized how little I didn't know and how much I needed to know. I want to focus on the subtitle of the book, Land Grabs, White Supremacy, and Miseducation at UC Berkeley. Hmm. Could you talk about each of those three and why you made them the focus of the title of your book? Yeah. Well, you know, if you think about the history of the United States and the most profound aspects of the, of the sorrows and tragedies of, 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 of American history, we think of, um, we think of racism and we think about exploitation of labor and we think about the slave trade. Uh, but here on the West Coast in particular, it's the history of land. And um, for people that don't know this, it's, it's, there's an interconnection between how the University of California got its land and the history of tribes and the history of the conquest of tribes in California. So um, Berkeley became the University of California. Berkeley was the only campus of the university for really almost the first 60 years of the, of the University of California. There was no other campuses until UCLA in the 1920s. And uh, in order to get started, um, the federal government under the uh, Lincoln administration in the 1860s uh, acquired lands from all over the country that had been, quote, abandoned by, by native peoples for the most part. But in fact, were the result of people being driven off their traditional lands and abandoning their lands because they were forced to do that as a result of conquest. And that land was then taken by the federal government and given to legislatures around, around the country. So the California legislature got this land, not, not land on which to build a university or to build a campus, but land on which could be sold, exploited, rented, uh, used for money. And that money would then be used by the legislature to start a university. So that was the financial beginnings of, uh, of the University of California at Berkeley. It was land that would have been expropriated. From, from tribes and native nations. 
And then uh, the second aspect of, of the importance of land for Berkeley is that the campus itself was built on land that the Ohlone had lived on for two, three, four, maybe 5,000 years. There's different evidence about how long people lived, lived on the land. And the land itself um, was actually a, a very, very important site of, of Ohlone settlements. Uh, um, for those of you that know Berkeley, we see that little creek that runs through the campus that's been submerged and polluted and driven under the, under the ground there. But originally, that was a very large free-flowing body of water. And it was enough water that people could sustain themselves. There was also uh, there was, uh, oak trees. There was uh, game in the hills. So that you had a whole set of settlements that went all the way down from, from, from the top of the hills, of Berkeley Hills, all the way down to the estuary. Uh, tens, uh, twenties of, uh, of settlements that people lived on for a long time and lived well because they had everything they needed materially. So the Berkeley campus itself was a site of, of Ohlone settlements, and uh, that's not been recognized by the university in, a, in other than sort of a generic way. And then the third way that land becomes an important part of the, of the story of Berkeley is that when the University of California was given the responsibility to develop the atomic bomb in New Mexico, taking over land that, became, that becomes Los Alamos, uh, land where the whole settlement of, of scientists and their families moved to. And that settlement uh, there and the work in the labs was actually oversighted by the Berkeley campus and by physicists from Berkeley and other parts of the UC system. And that land had been historically important burial grounds for indigenous people in New Mexico. But uh, they were then excluded from that land and not allowed to be a part of it. And in addition to that, the, uh, the research and experimentation that was going on on the bomb was um, uh, all, the, um, all, all the stuff that was produced in the making of that was put into the rivers and polluted uh, the water there and caused long-term health damage to the peoples of New Mexico, in particular indigenous people. So, um, so, so there's this interplay of land that's, that's, that you can't separate from the, from the history of the university and that the university has done nothing to really recognize or, or, or acknowledge. Uh, the, the second thing, white supremacy, is that I think it's important to understand how the University of California was really part of the original brain trust of the state of California. So it's right there from the beginning of the creation of the state and when we think about the history of California, you can't understand that history without also understanding uh, the role that Berkeley, which was the University of California for the first 60 years, played. And so if you come back to that un university and you come back to that place, there are several things that are striking. The regents, the administrators, many of the faculty have, been, have fought in the Indian Wars before they came to the Berkeley campus. Uh, many of them uh, supported the Confederacy or fought for the Confederacy or provided material support to the Confederacy. Many of them also later went on to uh, be involved in the occupation of the Philippines. So war, conquest, militarism is a critical part of the founding of the university. But if you'd come on the Berkeley campus in the 1870s, the 1880s, the 1890s, the 1900s, all the way up to really the 1930s and 1940s, it would have appeared to you that this is more like a military camp than a university because uh, military training was obligatory and the university, every time there was a major warfare going on, uh, World War I, uh, the, the occupation of the Philippines, later on World War II, the whole campus mobilized for military. And I know that there's a this mythology of, of Berkeley being the woke campus, being the anti-military campus, and there's been a long history of anti-militarism by students and community people at Berkeley. I mean, very active anti-war movement, for example, in the 1930s. But the institution itself, the institution of Berkeley, was uh, profoundly committed to war and militarism and celebrated that. So that's the second part of the history. And the third part of the history, the word, the term I use is miseducation, because right from the beginning, um, Berkeley and the University of California are, and, and at Stanford as well are providing the intellectual heft of the new state. They're pro providing the ideas, the arguments, the textbooks, the memoirs, the stories, and so on 
that are uh, so much a part of the way I think about the history of California. So they played a critically important role in promoting ideas about, uh, about the university and about the state. And here, I think they played a very critical role in, in promoting what I would call a manifest destiny uh, ideology. The sense that before there was Berkeley, before the university came, that in fact there was nothing, there was a wilderness. And in fact, the slogan of the university, that we all probably know very well, those of us at Berkeley, Fiat Lux, comes out of the Old Testament, you know, Genesis. Um, there was darkness and God said, let there be light. And the university adopted that slogan, uh, turned it into, into Latin, Fiat Lux, but at the same time, they imagined themselves coming and replacing a desert, a wilderness, a place where nothing had happened before, and had absolutely no curiosity about how people had lived and learned and created uh, b before the university arrived. So the, the intellectual work of the university is very much um, about uh, promoting conquest, promoting the idea that a civilization is coming to replace people who are uncivilized, and then embedded in that are all the racial ideas of eugenics and so on. And in some ways, this is um, more profoundly important than the, than the robbing of the graves and the plundering of the graves, because I think it had an impact on many generations of, of students and young people in California that went through schools and learned this history. And Berkeley intellectuals played a, a major role in promoting that notion of, of Berkeley as the civilizer of the uncivilized. Was Berkeley different than other universities during this time in this regard? Berkeley was similar to um, privileged universities around uh, in other parts of the country and other parts of the world. And Berkeley from very early on, because it could bring in a lot of money from, from the, uh, the entrepreneurs in the early days of the university, they imagined themselves not just being a public agrarian college, which was the uh, original idea, but they imagined themselves competing with Stanford, Harvard, Yale, uh, British and European museums. And from very early days, for example, in the 1890s, uh, the Hearst family, particularly Phoebe Hearst, were funding expeditions to Egypt and to Peru and to Mexico to dig up graves, to bring back human remains, to bring back artifacts and so on. So in that sense, it saw itself as being um, very competitive with a Harvard or in terms of museums, the British Museum, uh, Oxford, Cambridge. It aspired to play with the big boys. Berkeley's always had that sort of um, inferiority complex, right, of like wanting to be seen up there with, with the top folks. So I don't uh, know if it's inferiority or aspiration. As an educator, I want my law school to be one of the best law schools in the country. I don't feel inferior to other law schools, but I can aspire to be a top law school. Absolutely, you can aspire to be a top law school, and it is a top law school, but you, you often get that, that sort of edge from Berkeley, like, because they, they, they talk about how they're competing with the Stanford, or how they're competing with the Harvard, or how they're competing with the Yale. And what's interesting is how fast this happened in, in California. I mean, it's extraordinary that, that the University of California went from this idea of like serving the agricultural needs of the state, it went from that, and very, very quickly, it imagines itself uh, competing with Harvard and Oxford and Cambridge and so on. And um, that, that aspiration is fine, but the question is then, that aspiration means excluding uh, other histories, other peoples, uh, and also it means popularizing and celebrating conquest as well. Um, there's no problem with aspiring to imp to quality and to do the right to do the best possible work, but the question is at whose expense does that come? You touched on while you were speaking, and it's a good deal to focus the first part of the book, how Berkeley came to acquire a large number and amount of Native American remains. Yeah, I'm interested in why do you think Berkeley did that, and the role that it played in the development of the university, especially the anthropology department, which you focus a great deal on. Yeah. Well, I, I think from very early days, um, this was going on on the Berkeley campus. If you'd come on the Berkeley campus in the 1870s, you'd find people digging up things on the campus, the students, the faculty, the staff, digging up human remains. We know exactly where village sites were on the Berkeley campus. Uh, and so that was, um, you know, that was a sort of an amateur passion. A lot of people did that. A lot of people were interested in that. A lot of people at the early, the young university were interested in that. 
But also, again, Berkeley was looking to other major institutions around the world. They did look to what the European universities were doing. They did look to what the East Coast universities were doing. And anthropology and archaeology was a very important part of that. Um, and part of archaeology and anthropology was, um, was going to sites and digging up graves and um, digging up artifacts and accumulating artifacts. Um, and Berkeley, from very early on, uh, wanted to see themselves as being competitive with the German university, the French university, the, the colonial universities of Europe that were also sending military expeditions to other parts of the world, but were also taking back human remains and artifacts. That was part of what they thought knowledge was and so on. And uh, that was really um, confirmed and developed in a major way in the, at Berkeley when Phoebe Hurst became a regent at the university and joined the university uh, using the wealth of her husband, uh, who, had, who was older and died and made his money as one of the, the great robber barons of the West Coast. And she had a very strong interest in um, archaeology and anthropology, not just a, a hobby, not just sort of a, uh, she didn't just get involved in it in a dilettante way. She was really uh, seriously interested in it. So when she sent an expedition to Egypt, to dig up graves there, she went with it and so on. So because she was seriously interested in archaeology and anthropology, um, and because she was so influential in terms of bringing money and not only her own family money into the university, but other wealthy families, getting them to donate to the, to the university, um, the university then took her, her interests very seriously. And when the university finally created a anthropology department in about 1900, so for the first 10 years, she's sending out expeditions, collecting. This is going on in a major way. There's maybe a 1,000 human ancestors that have been collected on the, on the Berkeley campus, even before there's an anthropology department. But then when the anthropology department is set up, she runs it. And this was a, a big surprise to me. She doesn't give money to the university and to the regents and to the administration and says, OK, please use this money for anthropology and archaeology and expeditions. No, she actually directly runs the anthropology department. People send her the budget for the year, the salaries, the expeditions, the research, the plumbing, you know, the new buildings and so on. And she signs the checks and sends it directly to the anthropology department. So, um, and, you know, and I used to think that this emphasis on particularly on bringing back um, human remains to Berkeley, which they did in massive numbers, I think the collection I think the collection ended up being the largest amassing of human remains in, in the United States and possibly in Europe as well. I mean, it, it's up at that level, you know, whatever the actual numbers are. Um, I used to think that that was done in the name of, uh, of, of a science, it, basically a racist science, because there was a, a very strong racist science in the second part of the 19th century where people were looking at human remains, at the bodies, at the, at the limbs, at the, at the crania, looking inside the crania, measuring them and doing all of this and sort of mumbo -jo jumbo science. But I used to think that Berkeley was really motivated to do that. They were doing it in the name of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, what is called scientific racism. Um, and I thought that until I started the research for this book. And, that, and I changed my mind because they did very little science. I mean, this is the horror of it, that they bring back uh, the ancestors to the, to the university. They then break them up into different body parts. Um, they, they very rarely kept skeletons intact. So you have boxes of, of leg bones and boxes of arm bones and so on. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's a horrific thing. And when you talk to elders who talk about this history, people have just filled with sorrow when they talk about this. And then, you know, a few people did do some scientific work, very, very few people, um, but mostly it's just amassed, you know, it's just like accumulate, 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 kept all over the campus, kept in boxes, kept in cupboards and so on. That's why it's been so difficult to do a, a respectful repatriation in the present. And so I, I end up thinking that this is not so much about science, whatever the rhetoric is about it, but this is about hoarding and accumulating. You title one of the chapters in the books, Hoarding. Right. And one of the things that I kept wondering in reading, why did they want to keep these remains? And they obviously, as we'll talk about, fought against returning some of the remains. Mm -hmm. What is the benefit in terms of education, research, 
of retaining them? Well, I think here you have to sort of get into the, um, the psychology of colonialism, imperialism, conquest, what people want to do in order to not just possess a land or pet possess resources, but also possess, in a sense, the bones of the people as well. Um, I mean, I think, I think Berkeley got into it in a major way because they were looking elsewhere. They were looking at Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard and Yale and the British Museum, and they were doing it too. Uh, they were doing it in a very major way. And um, what, I, what struck me as being interesting when I went through all the Regents reports, all the internal records of the university and that the president of the, of the, that the Regents were putting out, that the chancellor of the university was putting out and so on, this was always very prominent. They had a great deal of pride in saying how many skeletons they brought back and where they brought them back from and then what else they got from inside the grave as well. And, but this wasn't just about um, human remains, which I, I, that human remains got a lot of publicity because it's sort of gory and, and people have a, a bizarre sort of macabre interest in it. But they are also um, accumulating hundreds of thousands, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of artifacts that have come from in and around the graves. And also they're having, they're buying collections from other people who are doing the same thing all over the world. Um, and then they're also um, in California where the, where the genocide was so severe and people were decimated by the, the genocide of the, of the second half of the 19th century, that they're going into impoverished communities, displaced indigenous communities, and they're buying artifacts from people at uh, incredibly low prices because people are desperate for food and medicine and survival and the force to do that. I mean, this, museums today consider this to be an unethical acquisition. In fact, they consider it to be a theft. They consider it to be a robbery because the people who are selling these items are not capable of, of making a, a, a contract in a, well, you would know this better than I, a, a contract in a, you know, in a responsible and fair and equitable way. So Berkeley's acquisition of hundreds of thousands of artifacts is also you know, not displayed anymore because it's now unethical and in some cases illegal to display things that are achieved in this way. So it, it's just kept and stacked and so on. Um, and I think we need to pay attention to how that accumulation was also a part of the accumulation of human remains. Congress, as you said, adopts a law in 1990, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Right. And yet you say in the book that Berkeley has not been in compliance with that law. Why not? I mean, in light of the changes in attitudes about all of this, why post-1990, why under the current administration, aren't there aggressive efforts to comply with this law? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a puzzling question, isn't it? Um, particularly for a university that provide, you know, likes to present itself as being so committed to social justice and equity and doing the right thing. Uh, so this law was passed in 1990. It, it's, a, it's a major piece of, of legislation for, for tribes and, and native nations because it's the equivalent of the Civil Rights Act for, for, for black Americans. This is, um, you know, when you, when you talk to people about the inequities of the past and and the solutions that people want, it's, it's about land and it's also about getting ancestors and, and artifacts back. So when that piece of legislation was passed by, by the federal government, by Congress in, in 1990, it was seen as a major breakthrough. And that legislation required any, uh, any organization or institution that had received federal money, they had to go through all their collections and everything that they had and they had to do an inventory, and then they had to put that inventory in the, in the public record through the uh, Department of Interior and the federal government, and then tribes could make claims against them and get them back. And when that legislation was passed in 1990, they said this will be all done within a few years. By 1995, maybe we will have repatriated everything back. So Ber of all the universities and institutions, Berkeley was the most recalcitrant uh, was threatened with fines and um, uh, didn't bring people in to do the inventory until they were forced to do that. Then when they did the inventory, um, didn't comply with the, the legislation, uh, didn't, didn't do anything but, but comply with the most, later on, comply with the most narrow legalistic 
aspects of the legislation by, okay, we put it up on the, uh, uh, we did the inventory and we think it's this and so on. But, um, you know, the, I, I think uh, my understanding is why there was so much resistance and opposition to this, which is well documented in the internal records of the university, um, is because there was no pressure to do anything different. And, um, you know, Berkeley, for example, prides itself on being the campus of free speech, um, almost like it invented free speech and supported it. But for those of you who remember, the university tried to stop the free speech movement and discipline students and expel students and brought in the cops and so on. But that, that battle over free speech had gone on at least since the 1930s. When I was doing the research for the book, I found that people were protesting about the lack of free speech, the lack of political freedom on the campus back in the 1930s and probably before that as well. So all of these things that we think of as Berkeley as being progressive, you know, ethnic studies, free speech, uh, anti-war movement, People's Park until recently and so on, they came out of, of political and social movements that, that pressured the university, pressured the institution to make a difference. And so there was, there was, the tribes were, were weak for a long time in California, recovering from genocide, recovering from the lack of federal recognition, uh, impoverished and so on. It took a long time, but there was always resistance there, but it wasn't sufficient resistance over a long period of time to get the university to take it seriously. And, and, and so the university was very dis dismissive of this. Um, and you saw this in the lack of Native American students on campus, the lack of Native American faculty, the lack of pressure coming from anybody inside the university to do things differently. So, you know, they, they didn't respond. They didn't have to respond. And, and it's only in the last eight or 10 years with changes in the governor's office and the legislature now putting pressure on the university with tribes uh, increasingly organizing and putting enormous political pressure on the university, activists in different parts of the state taking on the anthropologists and archeologists when they started coming around and trying to dig up things in the, in the 1960s and 1970s. That kind of pressure, um, and then more recently by ProPublica that did a major investigation of the Berkeley campus. And then finally, recently, the US Senate Committee on Indian Affairs in a ro remarkable show of, 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 uh, of voting on both sides, you know, Republicans and Democrats both voted to uh, send a letter to Berkeley criticizing the University of California for not complying with this legislation. Every member of that committee signed it. It's probably the only thing like that that's happened in the last five or 10 years. Um, sent it to the university. And now we're finally beginning to see some slow response uh, to what should have happened 30 years ago. I want to use that as the transition to talking about what you think should happen now. What do you want to see Berkeley do that it's not doing? I'd like Berkeley to live up to its reputation as being a great social justice university and a public university. I always think um, it's, a, it's a misnomer to really call Berkeley a public university because there's been so much private money that's involved in the university, so much federal money, so much research money. Um, in the early days, without the benefactors, without the so-called philanthropists, without the Hearst family, and the other wealthy ruling class families of California putting uh, money into, into Berkeley, building these kind of European style classical buildings on the campus and so on. Um, you know, w without that, um, uh, Berkeley would not have, have risen to, to Or power. today. Hmm. Today, 14% of the money that the campus receives is public money. Right. 86% of the money that Berkeley spends has to come through student tuition, or the money that it raises, right. or the money that it gets through contracts and grants and things like that. Yeah. The stunning statistic when you think of Berkeley as a public university, from my law school, 8% of our money comes from public money. So in one sense, we're public in name only. We right. have to go to other sources if we're going to exist. Absolutely. So, so here we are. We're in agreement about this. If Berkeley's going to call itself a great public university, and a social justice university, then it has to live up to that rhetoric. If it didn't have that rhetoric, I think it would be harder to say that Berkeley could do better than it does. Um, so, so that's one thing. That's just a, a very basic thing. And I think it, it, I don't think it lives up to its... It, and when you say live up to, what would you want it to do to live up to its claim of being 
a public university having a strong public mission? Yeah. So, first of all, I'd, I'd, like it, I'd like the university just to sort of stop business as usual and to think deeply and profoundly about what this history that's now being revealed, what that means for the place. Uh, the fact that the university has been so deeply involved in history of conquest, militarism, racism, white supremacy, miseducation. It, you know, if people agree with the, the research and, and the work that we've done. If, if we agree with that, then it, you can't just look, sort of set up a task force or create a new policy. You need to sort of ponder that in a very deep way. Uh, and, and the university needs to sort of stop business as usual and try to think about what does that mean for the, that's, that's number Could one. Could you be more specific when you say stop business as usual? Yeah. If you were the chancellor tomorrow, yeah. what would you do to stop business as usual? What I would do is I would involve the university in what it should be doing, which is education, learning, and research. And for example, um, the big crisis that's taking place on the campus and in and the city of Berkeley right now around People's Park, that there has been no public educational conversation on the Berkeley campus. There have been classes have talked about it, there have been protests, that people have different views and arguments and so on. But Berkeley as an educational institution has not uh, created a, uh, opportunities for people to have a serious learning experience about People's Park, its history, its context, and what the debates are now. The same around you know, Gaza and Israel currently. There's all kinds of policies and new regulations about how to deal with people's feelings and how to protect people and how to be sensitive and all of that. But the university has not fulfilled its primary obligation to be a place of learning and education. It's not brought all the, the brains and knowledge and people together to have a conversation about what's going on and what do we make of it. And to have the arguments. I mean, I, I think having a, an argument in a university is a good thing. When I taught at the, the School of Criminology at Berkeley that was closed down in the mid-1970s, um, uh, the oldest school of criminology in the, in the United States, an undergraduate, a master's, and a doctoral program. And uh, there was incredible arguments and debates there between conservatives, liberals, and radicals, and so on. And that, for me, made that, that program that I, that, I, that I taught in, it made that such a lively, interesting, engaged program. That uh, there's some, something about you know, the way that Berkeley tries to avoid having uh, arguments about important issues. I'd like to see those arguments taken. The one, the one I do remember is the because I just arrived from England as a graduate student. I came in 63, and in 1964, there was a convocation at the Greek theater to discuss what to do about the free speech movement. The whole campus, was, everything was stopped. All the classes were stopped. Everybody filled the Greek theater for that. I was there that day. And, um, and Mario Savio, was, who was one of the leaders of the free speech movement, wasn't invited to speak. So he got up on the stage and went over to the microphone and started speaking. And they brought in the cops and dragged him off the stage. You know? um, so, so, so to me, that was like, that's the closest the university in my history there has got into sort of a serious convocation uh, about issues. I mean, there's been all kinds of teachings and protests and discussions that are going on. But the university as an institution, I think, has shied away from that. So that's the second thing. Um, the third thing is, I, I think, um, we have to really seriously think about who's going to be at the table to make the changes that people want to make. There's a lot to change. Coming to terms with that history, uh, dealing with the long history and damage done by the racist miseducation that the university has promoted over generations. I mean, there's a long list. You have to read the book to, hear, to see the long list. But how to deal with those issues, I think, has to be a process of reckoning. And that process of reckoning has to involve all the key people who, who've suffered and been victimized and fought against the, the, those histories and, and those practices. And in California and at the University of California, indigenous people, native nations, tribes have to be at the table to begin the process of how do we, be, how do we come to terms with this and what do we do about it. So I'm, I'm not shying away from saying the 18 things that I think should happen. And I do mention them, some, some of them near the end of the book. But it's more about creating a process and an atmosphere and a political commitment and bringing everybody to the table that needs to be there who's been a part of this history. That, to me, is the priority. Towards the end of the book, you write, 
and I'll read this. I thought it was very powerful. We need to ask big questions. What would it take for Berkeley to live up its reputation as an agent of social change and public trust? What would it mean to reconsider the purpose of university from an indigenous perspective? What would it mean to come to terms without conquest, racial capitalism, sense of progress and entitlement, refusal to learn from your ancestors, the production and distribution of ideas about the inherent inferiority of the majority of the world's people, and the construction of California's cover line are an essential part of the universities and therefore the region's history. How would you answer your questions? How would I do that? Yeah, you pose these wonderful questions. Mm. What would you say to all of us now is how you would want to answer them? Well, I, I, I think fundamentally what's at stake here is what is a university for? And privileged uh, elite universities like Berkeley um, are built, I think, on attracting smart students, uh, smart faculty, creating interesting programs. But the, the institutional assumption of the institution is that it's going to give individuals assets that they will be able to improve their lives in the future. Uh, that's, that's the model of the Berkeley campus and of, of many other uh, privileged universities like that, based on the individual, based on increasing the assets of the individual so that they can capitalize them when they get out and become lawyers or professors or entrepreneurs or whatever. And I think um, I'd like to see a conversation about what would it mean to have a, uh, a university is not so much about individual assets, but social assets. A conversation about what would it mean to create a university that is socially responsible, that really practices social justice. Um, a university that um, considers a variety of bodies of knowledge uh, before thinking that there's only one way that we need to do things. I'd like to see that discussion. I'd like to see that discussion about a profound transformation um, and rethinking about what a university should be for. I want to get to questions from the audience. But before we do, what do you most want the audience to take from your description of the book? Or more specifically, for those who read this book, mm -hmm. what do you want them most to take from it? We've got to do something about this. <laughs> but I appreciate you coming tonight. Thank you for doing that. Wish I could see you better, but um, and thank you for the time.